I'm holding up my word here, okay? And, and uh, prophetically, what I feel happened to me this week, I'm gonna share what the Lord showed me, but, but the word that he gave me for today, for the year of 2021, is that it's gonna be the year of the double backbone, okay? So as we hold up the Lord's word, just pray for courage, okay? Trisha already, already quoted that verse this morning, that we wanna see what's unseen. That's how, it's, that's how it's spoken of in Corinthians. Paul said, we don't put our trust in these temporal things that we can see. We put our trust in the one who we can't see. So Lord, as we enter into 2021, we ask you for courage. You told Joshua, be strong and courageous. And we receive that word. And, and we receive the courage of a strong backbone. We will be like David who encouraged himself in the Lord. When things were, were coming down around him, he strengthened himself in you. We want to be like Jesus, who set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem to accomplish the mission that you sent him on, Lord. So we just open up our hearts to receive what you want to say to us today. We thank you for the power of your word to transform our lives. Let it be like a meal for us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, you marry a prophet and you start getting prophetic. That's what happens. <laughs> And uh, I've been on that journey for 35 years that I've been married to Trisha. And uh, I have more of an apostolic gift by my temperament and my gifting. But it's amazing when you open yourself up how the Lord will start to show you more visions and give you more dreams. And, and you know, there's that wonderful verse in the Old Testament in Proverbs. Uh, I'm going to quote it exactly in a little while here. But basically, God has things that need to be revealed. And as kings, we go find that revelation and we unpack it and bring it to people. And you might think, well, why does God make it hard? Because he, he rewards those who diligently seek after him. And I'm, I'm not meaning to get too critical here, but I've said it already, and I'm going to keep saying it, that the church in America got too soft. We, we forgot that, we, that, that the Bible is about confronting sin. And, and people, Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you if you're doing what, I, what I t I'm telling you to do. But... One way or another, aren't you glad somebody loved you enough to witness to you so that you would get saved? Yeah. Because if it was just, oh, pa patty cakes, patty cakes, no problem. Do whatever you want. There's no such thing as sin. I wouldn't have got delivered from drugs. And that changed my life when I got saved. So, you know, much as nobody wants to be rejected, if you know that the Lord is directing you, you can do this double backbone, which I'll, I'll unpack what he said to me. But I'll just give you a picture of the, the, the cover of the video that we posted in this past week. It's from Jane Hammond, who um, we've had here several times. Uh, her father-in-law, Bill Hammond, is the one that founded Christian International Ministries, who is a leading voice of the prophetic movement from 60 years ago. Okay, He's, he's in his mid-80s right now, still travels, well, once COVID's over. But last year, he did 200,000 miles on the road in his mid-80s. Amazing. Power of the Lord. And, and there's just a real strong anointing for the prophetic at Christian International and all over the world from, from them. And during the, one of their prayer times, uh, um, one of the pastors on their staff said, I hear the Lord saying, and, and what, I, what I wrote in the title there is, dance the dance of the Mahani. <laughs> now, I don't know if you knew what that meant. I had to go look it up. And the guy that said it prophetically on their staff didn't know what it meant. He just knew that he heard the Lord saying, this is what I want you to do. Dance the dance of the Mahanaim. <laughs> oh, man. Like, that's how God is. And he reveals something, and then we go dig up the treasure. You know, we find out what, what is he talking about. And, and it, it felt very strongly. It was right, you know, mid-December about what we're doing to cross over into the new year. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, just what, where, the, where the verse comes from, Song of Solomon, uh, ver, chapter 6, verse 13, is here. It says, the Shunammite bride, uh, I'm reading from the Passion Translation, she says to the king, why would you seek a mere Shunammite like me? Sorry, Shulamite, like me. Why would you want to see my dance of love? All right, and you know Solomon was smitten by the Shulamite woman, and it's a beautiful parallel, as, as you read the Song of Songs, to God's love for us. And this is from Brian Simmons, a Passion Translation. He actually has a vision to bring the Song of Songs to Broadway. <laughs> Talk about making it real to people. 
you know, and I'm trying to help him raise money to do it because he's got a beautiful vision. That passion translation is going all over the world. And this is from a pastor who was in Connecticut for many years, pastor in a local church. The Lord just really hit him hard, first with Song of Songs. Uh, so read his translation. It's a beautiful love story of God's love for us. But anyway, she says to him, I'm, a, I'm basically a nobody. Why are you looking at me during this dance? And the bridegroom king, is how Brian Simmons says it, because you dance so gracefully, it's as though you dance with angels. And I alluded to it earlier during worship is in the Old Testament, when people went to the temple, in their minds, they were going into the presence of the Lord. They were going to God's house, and they were entering into a place where he lived. And then in the New Testament, God says, no, you don't have to do that anymore. I live inside of you, and you are the temple. So when you show up together, there's a bunch of people with my presence, and when we all worship together, it does something to all of us in the room. So wouldn't it be just like the devil to get us to stop meeting and to force us to wear masks and not sing and be afraid to worship? No, fear breeds unbelief. Right? We got to live by faith. Don't get arrested, but live by faith, okay? So basically, if you want to just take the short version of what Solomon was saying, is like there's an anointing on your dance. It's like you're dancing with angels. And Baha Naim means two camps, the camp of men and the camp of angels. And that reminds you of Jacob's ladder, right? He said, I can sense the presence of the Lord here. And there was a ladder going up and down from heaven. And wouldn't we all love to live in that place of the open heaven? I hope you say yes, because that's the best GPS system you'll ever have of how you should live your life is to let the Lord be the total GPS of your life. Every second of every day matters to him. So that's a beautiful picture. So this pastor on their staff that was praying, I think his name is Greg, said, the Lord tells us that for this upcoming year, we have to dance the dance of the two camps, men and angels, where heaven meets earth. And boy, is that true. Yeah. And he's highlighting it for us this year. And I said it this way, um, under the, the notes in the Passion Translation, there's extensive notes. So I encourage you to, you can look it up online. You can copy and paste it. It's just so easy. If you have two screens, put the passion up over here, put a Word document, just copy and paste. And there's tons of notes in almost every chapter. It, it's incredible how much work Brian Simmons has done. But this is one of the things he said, that it means that dance of the two armies. But also, like, when Solomon looked at her operating in this place of the two camps, it was like there was a supernatural anointing on you. And we're going to need that this year. Okay, we always need it, but there's a very contentious thing going on towards the church. A lot of opposition coming against the church. Um, that's never been a problem for Christians. Christians have always flourished when there was opposition against them because where sin abounds, you know the verse, grace abounds even more. One version says it super abounds. So sometimes people need to feel the, the sting a little bit of the persecution in order to realize where they stand. And, and you heard my wife say it already, and uh, you know, for 35 years that we've been married, that's never changed in, in her or, or in my position either. If, if we get persecuted for our beliefs, we, we knew that coming into this, and it's okay. Uh, that's how people change. They're going to object, you give them the truth. And if it's anointed with the Holy Spirit, that's the double backbone that we're gonna need, right? Because we speak the truth, but we do it in love. We do it under the anointing. So the word can be a hammer, but the Holy Spirit can be oil. And God's going to give you that open heaven over your life to know at which time to use it. And the picture that he gave me um, was, was that picture right there of when we were praying, we were speaking in tongues, and there was a real strong presence in our, in our prayer time. And as I had my head down, I saw coming up from the ground a, a spinal column. And I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I prayed into it. I knew it's the Lord was saying, you're going to need a strong backbone as you're coming into this new year. But it also reminded me of Jacob's ladder. So as I looked it up, one, one version where you see the stairway, they were comparing it to the DNA spiral. And, and they were making that comparison of between heaven and earth, God, we're created in God's image. And, 
and that open heaven above us. And the other one on the other side, the blue one, is more a stairway, you know, going up and down for the angels to go up and down. But, but mine was like a ladder where they were climbing up each side of the, up and down really, each side of the spinal column. And that's the double part of this is that the spirit has to operate with the truth. Yeah. And, and the picture is this. Um, and I don't know if you know who these people are, but I put their names up there for you. And it's, it's war movies. For me, I've always been a good analogy of spiritual warfare, right? And, you know, if you're in a Christian version that says there's no such thing as spiritual warfare, you're definitely in the wrong church, okay? Because we, we can tell you pretty much where to look in the Bible if you don't believe it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 is a good place to start. The book of Ephesians 5 and 6 is a really good place to start. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay, if that doesn't tell you about spiritual warfare. and The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the demolishing of strongholds. So these are three different movies. The two characters that are on the same side is Desmond Doss from Hacksaw Ridge and Marcus Luttrell from the movie Lone Survivor. And I don't know the man's name on, on the side that says Saving Private Ryan, but I've never forgotten the scene of him being frozen in fear at the bottom of the stairs. And uh, it's a very profound thing that we're not mocking, but he froze in fear. And somebody died on his team, even though he had the gun. And he couldn't walk up the stairs and help his friend, and his friend got killed. And then the German soldier that killed his friend walked down and walked right past him, even though he had a gun. And it was even more of a statement of shame that I'm not worried about you. You had the gun, didn't use it. I don't even need to kill you. Wow. Oh. Oh, wow. Who wants to be that guy? I don't want to be that guy when I stand before the Lord. And I met Marcus Luttrell at a, at a meeting because my last company I worked for, they could see that I had done a few meetings in my life, <laughs> not knowing that it was from all the church meetings that I've done. And, uh, you know, to run a corporate meeting is much easier than to run a church when you, you know, for 10 years we set up and broke down every week in a high school auditorium. So, you know, these people in corporate America don't even know how good they have it. But they would ask me to get involved. And I, I welcomed him as the guest speaker to one of these big events. And it was a beautiful you know, no, they don't spare any expenses when they hold these meetings. Beautiful corporate uh, park that we were in. No, but hotel, beautiful hotel, but it was very corporate. And, and I'm one of the hosts there, so I'm supposed to welcome the speakers that are coming. And he walks into this big ballroom, and he's got a golden retriever next to him. And he's a big guy. He's 6'5", bigger than me. And I'm thinking, what's a dog doing here? I, I didn't know anything about his story. I come to find out that he was still suffering from post-traumatic stress. And the dog was there to help him, that if he got triggered in the PTSD, he could have been walking outside and a car could backfire, and he's brought back into the battlefield from hearing that sound. And yet he's here to speak to us. Amen. <laughs> See, the courage. Wow. If anybody could fold, he could have folded and say, oh, no, I'm not strong enough to speak. But even in a broken condition, you could argue, you know, he's not fully healed the way we would understand healing. He still spoke for an hour, not a dry eye in the room, not a peep out of the, out of the crowd while he was speaking. And when I shook his hand, I really felt like something happened. <laughs> it was like you're in the presence of a really brave warrior. And it's almost like a throwback to a different time. In high school, he and his twin brother were being groomed by his father to go into the Navy SEALs. He's 6'5", 240 pounds. The average SEAL is 5'9", 160. So it's even harder to get into the SEALs if you're that big because they spend so much time underwater that it gets in the way. Your muscle and your bones get in the way. Both of them made it into the SEALs. And I don't know if you know much of the story. I'm, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but... I can tell you there was anointing in the room of courage. And we all felt it. And you knew you should honor veterans. <laughs> can we just say that, church? We need to honor the veterans. We need to honor the police officers. 
They're not all bad. I know there's some bad ones, but they're not all bad. They're risking their life. When did that go south? That we disrespect the people that are willing to die. This guy wanted to still be in the seal. He couldn't. He had 300 deployments. 20 different broken bones had been shot in five, six different times. I don't even remember all the statistics. You get the point. He couldn't do it anymore. He physically couldn't do it without getting a miracle healing. But he never stopped telling the story of what it was like. And the whole thing about his story was you never quit. No matter how bad it looks, you never quit. And the whole thing of going through SEAL training is to see who's willing to quit. You know what it means, ring the bell? At any time in that hell week, they can ring the bell and that means they're gone. But if you make it through, everybody else on your team knows you're all in and you're not gonna quit. That's for the church. That's why I feel the Lord has shown me this, is this double backbone. And, and you could look at it in, in the message version in John chapter four, I'm guessing you all know the story of the woman at the well, which is behind me on that stained glass. It's from John chapter 4. It's a really extended, beautiful, long story of how Jesus meets this woman at the well, and he has a prophetic word for her. And it's a beautiful interaction that's part of the lesson that I'm going to try to convey today because we're interacting with people all the time, and they're at different stages in their knowledge of God, their willingness to even want to know God, but does God want to speak through us to that person? Yes. Every one of them, he wants us to speak to them. He wants us to open our mouth and let him speak through us. So this is what he said to her about worship. In the, again, it's a message, and it's not the full 21 through 24, but this part, these parts are taken from those verses. You worship guessing in the dark. <laughs> she was a Samaritan, right? And they didn't worship the same way the Jews did. We Jews worship in the clear light of day, but the time is coming. It has in fact come when what you are called will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. We could spend the day on that, couldn't we? It's not what you're called, and how would that translate into 2021 in America is, yes, I'm an Italian-American, but I'm a Christian before I'm an Italian-American, or before I'm black or white or Native American or whatever. I have my identity this way, as a child of God. <laughs> so when Joan Hunter was here, she talked about the song, No Longer Slaves to Fear, I Am a Child of God. That was Jonathan Helser. Go watch the video. It's on our... It's on our YouTube channel, I keep talking about it, but what she said in six minutes gives you the backstory of that song. He said, when I was in my mother's womb, you have chosen me, not knowing that his mother was supposed to get a hysterectomy right before she gave birth to him. But a prophet came to her and the husband and said, don't abort this baby, he's gonna be a prophet and he's gonna sing worship songs that are gonna go all around the world. He wrote that not knowing that. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. Yeah, I'll tell you what. So it's not, this is so important, isn't it? It's, but the time is coming that it's not what you're called that will matter. It's who you are and the way you live. And we lost that vision corporately, I think, in the American church to just be, church is this nice little thing that I do on Sunday and I check in and then I go live my life during the week, and then I come back and check in. And, and God is saying, you know, you, you're far underestimating what I want to do and be for you in your life. I want you to be my child. I want you to reflect the glory of God into the marketplace. And he says, your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. All right, now we know that in other versions he said, the Father is seeking those who will worship him. Come on. Spirit. And in truth, even if you're mumbling, say, we're in truth. <laughs> I can't wait till we lose these masks. Oh, please, Lord, no more delay. <laughs> so the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the oil and the hammer, if you want to look at it that way. The word can be a hammer, and it's referred to that way. But Jesus made it clear that there's a way to deliver the word where you can have oil on it. And, and that's what he did with this woman, this Samaritan woman, right? Because let's just say he knew when he first met her that she was living deep in sin, right? If he was real religious and legalistic, he would have been hammering her. 
You better change. If you die in this condition, you're going to burn in hell. It's not what he said. He met her where she was. I have living water. She had had five husbands and is now living with another one. She was trying to quench her thirst in a relationship with a man. Jesus is saying, no, I have better water. You drink what I give you, you'll never be thirsty again. Big difference when you live that way. And we know she went on to be a great uh, evangelist. Another day's story. So I don't want to be the missing backbone guy who's frozen at the bottom of the stairs while my friend is being killed upstairs. I want to be a combination. Now, again, you might have seen De uh, Desmond Doss in Hacksaw Ridge. It's a pretty bloody movie. It's made by Mel Gibson. I think he, if I ever get to meet him, I'll say you didn't have to make it as violent as you did. But he didn't ask me. He didn't call me before he made the movie. It's a war movie, and it's very violent. But this is a true story of a Christian man. He was a Seventh-day Adventist, right? But that's still you know, a, pretty, a Christian denomination that doesn't line up exactly with what we believe, but he was he's holding the Bible. You can barely see it in that picture, but that scene is near the mid to the end of the story where he comes in and they're beating him up because he won't carry a weapon. So nobody on his team wants him with them because they're afraid if you're out on the battlefield with us and you don't, you're refusing to take a gun, then you're going to put us at risk. And he wins them over, not because he's preaching at them, because of his courage. And he can't really see it in this picture, but in this picture, he's praying with the Bible in his hand, and his hands are all wrapped because the night before, he had saved 75 soldiers off the battlefield. He was running into the battle, finding the wounded guys while the warfare is going on around him, dragging them to the edge of a cliff and letting them down by a rope, and his hands were getting shredded by the rope. And as his, he's leaning back in the movie, he says, one more, Lord, show me one more. Ho! Oh! Talk about courage. He even brought two Japanese soldiers. And, and the medics wouldn't take care of them. I know. Think of that. Whatever. Another day's topic. He, he didn't force his faith on anybody. He lived it. That's the spirit side. Marcus Luttrell was more the hammer. Okay? He was shooting people. He was killing the enemy. He wouldn't quit. Two different examples of courage that we have to understand. Sometimes I think the church has been too passive, too much on the sidelines. Don't talk about that. Don't ruffle anybody's feathers. We need a little more Marcus Luttrell. We need a little more lone survivor. I'm never going to quit. But we also need Desmond Doss. That's the double backbone who's going to take the persecution and still not fight back and win them by our testimony. That's a good combination, but it's not easy, is it? Because you hear things like, love the sinner but hate the sin. That sums it up pretty good, but boy, it's hard to do, isn't it? You really need to pray and seek the Lord, and fasting and prayer is such a key part of our lives. You know, as, as Trish and I have been married together, she has helped me understand why it's so important. And, and I really haven't stopped fasting since the last one that we did which was a couple of months ago, because this year has just been so contentious and, and really have to throttle your appetites is the best way I could say it, because in, the, in all the tension and anxiety that's been going on, there's so many counterfeits that pop up and try to look attractive. And Jesus said, no, you got to be the one who builds your house on the rock. Yeah. Don't build your house on this sinking sand of these counterfeit affections that the culture's offering you. And getting into... Debates with people won't go there. So last week I said these are the five areas the Lord showed me for 2021. As we take the gospel from the church to the streets, right? Like Sean Floyd is doing with his worship protest, uh, worship meetings that he's having. I'm taking the gospel outside the four walls of the church. And he said the church has left the building. Well, the church was always supposed to leave the building. <laughs> We were never supposed to just keep it all just for here. What, what Sundays are meant to be is, look at all the amazing things God did this week in my life. And we encourage one another. Psalms and hymns, we speak in spiritual songs to one another. We encourage each other. We pray for each other. If somebody got a, a situation, we pray for each other. And we say, go do great exploits for the Lord again this week. Yeah. Right? That's right? 
So take the gospel from the church to the streets and remember that the waves and wind still know his name. Speak to the raging storms and say, peace be still. You have that authority as a Christian with the Spirit of God living on the inside of you and the filter of the Word of God to understand the truth. Third one was sort out the chaos and the unfinished business all around you by completing your God-given assignments. And that's a verse that Paul was speaking to Titus and said, the reason I left you in Crete is so that you could sort it out. This exactly how he said it. Sort out the chaos and the unfinished business all around you. Well, that's another way of describing what the church is supposed to be in the culture. It's supposed to be the plumb line. It's supposed to be people that are trying to live exemplary lives according to this book, according to Jesus. We're being transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. Do we get it perfect? No, of course not. Nobody gets it perfectly, but the fact that David was a man after God's own heart is why God loved him. And that's what he wants us to be, people that are after God's heart. So, you know, if you're in kindergarten, you're not expected to do calculus. But you're supposed to work your way through all the iterations on your way. So wherever you are, God can bring you another level higher for the rest of your life. No matter how high you get in the Lord, there's always going to be another level he can take you. And it might be lower, actually. Because <laughs> more service, more humility. Is, is what can actually, you know, we, we let go of the bags off the, that hot air balloon and, and it gets us higher. We get rid of our baggage. He takes us higher into him. Yeah. I still got a few verses to read, so I'm going to keep going. But this is the one that I quoted already. The time is approached for Jesus to be taken back to the Father. So with strong resolve, Jesus made for Jerusalem which was his destination. That's what backbone means. That's what strength and courage and, and standing up and standing your ground when things are coming against you. It's strong resolve. Jesus had backbone. He knew he was about to be crucified, but he had to go to Jerusalem. And that's what I'm saying that the Lord is saying to us as the church. And there's going to be times that you'll be persecuted and he's going to tell you not to respond like Desmond Doss. And there's going to be other times that he wants you to be Marcus Luttrell. You can translate that into the female version. Go see Wonder Woman. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Apparently, uh, there's some parallels to spirituality in this new one. I'm not giving you a commercial for Wonder Woman. <laughs> Ephesians 5.16. This is also in the message. Pretty blunt. You know, Paul could be pretty blunt sometimes as he's writing to us because he's a good dad. And he says, wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffins. Christ will show you the light. <laughs> Say la, right? Pause and meditate if, if that applies to us. If we've gotten too comfortable as the church, as the culture's winding down around us, ethically just demolishing the identity of a man and a woman for little kids, telling kindergarten kids you can pick whether you want to be a boy or a girl. No, you can't. Can somebody just have enough backbone to say, no, you can't, right? right? There's a difference. Yeah. Well, we, if you told me in high school that I was going to have to say that there's a difference between a man and a woman biologically, I would have looked at you and said, what the heck happened? How could anybody go that, that direction? And I'm not, I'm not insensitive to the fact that some people are, are dealing with struggles in that area, but there's people dealing with struggles in every area. Right, like that's the heart of man. It's deceitfully wicked. CEOs of major corporations have been fired. So, you know, you could be upset about the Me Too movement, but there's been tons of abuse for thousands of years that women have been abused sexually. You can't blame them if they don't know the Lord. They've got to lash back out. Finally, somebody's saying something. Me too. I was harassed. I was raped. My boss took advantage of me. And I'm a single mom with a kid, and I couldn't just quit the job and leave. God hates that. Hates injustice. All kinds of it. But what's the solution? Forgiveness. Repentance. Without the Lord, you're not getting there. It's supernatural. It's got to be God. So it's not wrong for them to want to seek. It's not wrong for people to say, this is what's going on is wrong. The solution of Christ is forgiveness. That's a hard one if they're not saved. That's why the world needs a revival. So watch your step, use your head, 
This is Galatians 5 again. Watch your step, use your head. <laughs> Sound like you need to do this today? Make the most of every chance you get because these are desperate times. Wow. He's saying this 2,000 years ago. You think it's more desperate today or more desperate in his times? More Believe it or not, I'm going to say it was worse then. Wow. All right? I'm going to say it was worse then. Study my ancestors, the Romans. They were brutal people. When you went into one of the Roman towns, you saw people hanging on crosses. These were the thieves. This is how they punished the thieves. They crucified people. There was no Miranda rights, <laughs> right? You weren't presumed innocent until proven guilty. They had no clue. It was all the sword, the power of the sword to kill you. And Jesus came and defeated death and rose from the dead. But their culture they lived in was way worse than what we're dealing with right now. And I'm not minimizing what we're dealing with. But let's just keep it in perspective, okay? You with me? Because yeah. in Hebrews 12, you probably know it, in the NIV it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, right? all these amazing saints that have gone on before us, that carried Chris, Christianity into really dark places in the world, risked their lives... We're not risking our lives on a daily basis, are we? And yet, it's still hard to face the persecution that comes at us. It's still hard to say, I'm planting my flag in the ground no matter what happens. I'm taking a stand for the Lord. And he said, if you deny me, I'm going to have to deny you. So it's not like this is a minor point in the Bible. Like We have to have that double backbone in operation in our lives. We need courage and strength. We have to do this with resolve. Let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. So you are running a race, no matter how old, if you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, Bill Hammond's in his 80s, 200,000 miles traveling last year to preach. Doris Wagner had, had part of her leg amputated. She's in a wheelchair. She was driving around the country doing deliverance sessions until COVID hit, and then she's... I just saw a text from her. We're going back on the road. <laughs> All right? She's 87, if I remember right. Incredible resolve. I'm going to make the most of the chance that God has given me here. This is my time, and I'm not wasting a day. Her husband, Peter, same thing. Amazing people. All right? They're going to, they're going to run the race. They're laying aside the sins. Let us run the race with perseverance that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. I love that version of this. I'm fixing my eyes, like Trisha quoted, and I'm going to get there too. We don't look at the things that are temporal and not lasting. We look at what's eternal, and that's this Word of God, and that's the example that Jesus set for us, and that's the presence of God that lives inside of us that's giving us a foretaste of what we'll have for eternity, the Holy Spirit. We have God's nature residing on the inside of us, but our flesh doesn't like to bow down in submission to it. That's why going on a fast will help. And I'll do this quickly because there's some great examples in Hebrews 11. Trisha didn't know I was going there, but she quoted it already. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It's what he believed, not what he brought. It's also in the message. That made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved. What? Faith. The whole chapter is about faith. The whole chapter is about not looking at the thing you can see, but looking at your relationship with God, looking at the truth. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. I'm standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. We were singing it all morning, weren't we? But you have to have faith in it and not be rocked by the stuff that's going on around you. We don't ultimately answer to the President of the United States. We ultimately answer to the King of all kings, right? He's over the whole universe. Before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. I'd rather go to him. Verse 7, by faith Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. His act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the rightness of the believing world. And I'm saying that's who you and I are in the culture. We're drawing a line. This is the right way to live according to God's standards. You're free to do whatever you else you want in America, but Desmond Doss lived it in such a way that they were attracted to him. They were apologizing to him. The guy comes up to him and says, I was all wrong about you. I thought you were a coward. 
because you didn't want to carry a gun. You're the bravest guy in the whole troop. And then the general calls and says, why haven't you taken the hill? And the officer says, we're waiting. You're waiting for what? Das, he's praying. We're not gonna go until he tells us his God said it's time to go. True story. Never had to fight back. It's the oil of the word. And then it says about Noah, right? He built this ship like it's hard to grasp how much attack he would have been under, right? Like how stupid it is to build this big ark that's not even raining. But it was by faith. And that's what God honors is our faith. And he drew this line between how we're supposed to live, the decadent lifestyle. They were eat, drink, and be merry. And he's like, nah, I'm sorry. There's a different, different relationship you need to be responsible to. And it says, as a result, Noah became intimate with God beautiful picture. Verse 11, by faith, the barren Sarah, good word, huh? Barren Sarah was able to become pregnant, old woman as she was, because she believed the one who made a promise would do what he said. Each one of these people of faith died not yet having in hand what was promised, but still believing. How did they do it? Verse 14, they saw it way off in the distance. They waved their greeting and accepted the fact that they were just transients in this world. People who live like this make it plain that they are looking for their true home. By faith, Moses, when he was grown, refused the privileges of the Egyptian royal house. He chose a hard life with God's people rather than an opportunistic, sort, soft life of sin with the oppressors. Man, think of how easy the devil makes it look. Just do it my way. I could have put Serpico up there as one of the brave people too, right? I don't know if you know that story, but he was a real police officer in New York City. He was a kid that grew up in the neighborhood and he had a heart to want to protect people, so he became a cop. He gets put in a division where every police officer in his division is on the take for drugs. They were all helping the drug dealers and taking money. And he took a stand against it, and they tried to kill him, right? So listen, if you're going to try to bring the truth into a culture that's rapidly de de declining ethically, you're going to need faith. You're going to have to focus on what the truth of the Word of God is and be special forces like Marcus Luttrell was, right? It's like he's in the Navy SEAL. He's trained to go do the mission. But I'm not going to be intimidated by the fact that the culture's going in the toilet. They don't know any better. You know, Trisha talked about what Lisa's going to talk about next week, but when you give women a, an alternative through a crisis pregnancy center, you're not standing there telling them they're going to hell. You're trying to love them into the kingdom. You're giving people an, another way to go instead of the route that they think. And I, I really highly encourage you to watch the movie Unplanned. Watch it this week if you can. Look it up. It's very difficult to watch when you see what they're doing in these abortion clinics. But it's important that you do to know that if that was the only thing we worked on, it would be enough. It's not, but we should be working on that. How is this okay that 60 million plus babies have been aborted? It's not. But what are we doing about it? We, we're gonna have to stand before the Lord and are we gonna be the guy at the bottom of the stairs frozen in fear with the gun? Or are we going to be the two guys with the backbone that stood up even though the odds were against them and said, I'm all in. We don't, we don't ever quit. We're going to go for this. I'm winding it down. Moses valued suffering in the Messiah's camp far greater than the Egyptian wealth. <laughs> they had it tougher than we do, folks, okay? We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And if I showed up and said, oh, man, we were so persecuted, there was an election, didn't go the way we wanted it to go. I'm not saying that it hasn't gone the way we want it to go, but like they would look at each other like, he thinks the election is persecution? <laughs> really? Like, we better let him know what it was like when we were alive. There's a great cloud of witnesses saying, stand up, have a double backbone. You can do it with God. He's given you his word. He's given you his spirit. He's given you the truth. Be a light in the midst of the darkness and speak the truth to people. They need to hear it. Oh, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to finish here in Corinthians where Trisha was. 2 Corinthians 4, 8. 
again, Paul just being really blunt, talking to the Corinthians who were kind of a secular church. He says, we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, yet not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And if you were here this morning, you sang that with us. That was the first song we sang, Trading My Sorrows. This is one of the verses in that song. I'm blessed beyond the curse, the author said, because his promise will endure and his joy is gonna be my strength, even in the middle of whatever persecution that we're facing. We have the same spirit of faith. We say, it's written, I believe, so I spoke it, right? So Paul's just quoting the Psalms here. And he said, we too believe, and so we speak. And in this decade of the decree, right? You know what I'm talking about? 5780 on the Jewish calendar. We went into a new decade, and it's the decade of the decree. I won't give you the teaching on that now. Our mouth is a weapon for God. If you seal your lips out of fear because you're afraid of persecution, you're not using your weapon. If you're only a hammer and you got no love, you're misusing your weapon. If it's only everything goes, you're not using your weapon, right? This is a pretty big, complicated thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to translate this book into how we live in every conversation, every interaction. I'm going to skip that one too. Go to 16. For this reason, we don't lose heart. Even if our outer humanity is decaying, our inner humanity is being renewed day by day. That should get somebody happy in here. I can't tell if you guys are smiling or mad at me because you got these masks on. Are you happy that even though your outer man is decaying, that your inner humanity is being renewed day by day? And he says, this slight momentary trouble of ours is working to produce a weight of glory. Stand up, okay? Let's just, let's just bask in this for a minute. This is such good news. It's such good news. We've got the truth. We use our mouth as a weapon, and we speak it into the atmosphere, and we can see the atmosphere shift by our words because we're in line with what God wants to say in that situation. But he said, look, even though the body that you live in is decaying, your inner man is being renewed day by day. You don't ever have to retire as a Christian. In fact, if you're a writer, you actually get more wisdom as you get older. You can write more books the older you get about all the mistakes you made. <laughs> and then I love this. Can we say it? Verse 17. Can you read it with me? This slight momentary trouble of ours is working to produce a weight of glory passing and surpassing everything lasting forever. That's what I want to leave you with, okay? Yes. It's not fun. I get it. We're being persecuted for, for what we believe because we're, we're just taking an interpretation of the Bible that says God cares about marriage. He wants marriage to be between a man and a woman. He, you know, like, wow, that's radical. No. It's common sense. It's what cultures have been built on for thousands of years, right? The enemy's going to always try to attack the foundation. No, no. We're going to stand and see I'm going with God. I'm doing it His way. Oh, this glory. Slight momentary trouble is working to produce a weight of glory that's in us, that's passing and surpassing everything. So the glory inside of us is going to be forever. The afflictions are momentary. No comparison. If we don't look at the things that can be seen, but at the things that can't be seen, right? That's God. I think I'm going to end it there. So go ahead and lift your hands.